Lipids. This is Jack Brooke from Columbia Gorge Community College. In this session, what I'd like to do is just uh, real briefly talk about the uh, lipids and structure uh, of the three main types of lipids. Uh, with that, we're going to then have sessions leading to uh, lipoproteins and cardiovascular disease. So with this session, we'll just uh, do a brief a review of the lipids and then uh, go from there to their risks uh, in health and um, cardiovascular disease. So there are three main types of lipids. The first one I want to introduce is are the triglycerides and uh, the reason that they're called triglycerides is because they do have three fatty acids and those three fatty acids are connected to a structure, a three carbon structure called a glycerol. So the two main uh, parts of a triglyceride are glycerol and the three fatty acids and you can see the three fatty acids are just uh, long chains of carbon um, but there can be variations of those fatty acids which will make uh, the triglycerides uh, different. Uh, in the triglycerides, the fatty acids can be uh, different chain links. Um, by definition, uh, we are going to say that uh, fatty acids that are less than six carbons in length um, will be short. Anything between six and ten will be medium, and anything over ten carbons in length will be long up to uh, 24 carbons. And then uh, what you also may notice um, if you do count the number of carbons is that fatty acids always come in even numbers. You will never see a carbon length fatty acid of 7 or 9 or 13. They're always in even numbers. And uh, there is a reason for that. We won't get into that uh, in this class because we don't get that much into metabolism. But uh, suffice it to say that when you construct a carbon, we take two carbon or a fatty acid, you'll take two carbon units and you'll stick them together in long chains. And then also when you're breaking those fatty acids down as an energy source, uh, you will break them down into two carbon units. And if you know anything about um, metabolism and production of ATP, those two carbon units will go into the mitochondria and become acetyl-CoA. Then they'll go through the Krebs cycle, go through the electron transport chain, and eventually end up making uh, ATP. Uh, there are three types of fatty acids. Um, you may have heard of saturated fats. Well, saturated fats would be foods that contain a high percentage of their fatty acid chains uh, being saturated or in other words their all of their carbons are completely saturated with hydrogen atoms and so as you can see the very top uh, picture the saturated fatty acid you will see that um, all of the carbons are connected to hydrogens except at the very end uh, which is going to be the end that will be eventually connected to the glycerol to make the triglyceride um, so these are considered saturated you find them very high in animal fat so beef fat chicken fat um, those types of things would be uh, or anything that's made out of animal products so like butter would also be high in saturated fats because they come from animal fat. And then tropical oils, which would be um, the coconut oil, uh, palm kernel oil, and then cocoa or chocolate kind of oils would be highly saturated uh, also. Uh, monounsaturates, uh, monounsaturated, mono means one. So if you'll notice the yellow. Uh, picture here, this yellow chain, you'll notice that at one um, point within the fatty acid chain, you are missing hydrogens. Um, and what will also form there is a double bond. Uh, if you've taken some chemistry, what you may remember is that carbon is missing four electrons. 
And what these lines represent are uh, the bonding or the sharing of two atoms and sharing of their electrons. Uh, and so because carbon needs four uh, electrons and needs to share with four other things, you'll notice up in the saturated, it shares with this carbon, this carbon, this hydrogen, and this hydrogen. So that gives it four that it's sharing. And here, when you're missing hydrogens, you've got one, two, but then you need two more. So what is created is, is called a double bond. And um, that is uh, what is referred to as an unsaturation point within the fatty acid. So because there is one double bond or one position where you're missing hydrogens, they would then be called a monounsaturated fatty acid. Uh, sometimes referred to uh, this little uh, symbol here reflects an omega. So sometimes referred to as omega-9 fatty acids. Uh, you'll find uh, foods that are uh, high in monounsaturates um, would be the olive oils, canola oils, peanut oils are very high in monounsaturates. And um, this double bond and one other um, factor with monounsaturates is that um, foods that are uh, solid at room temperature are considered to be fats. So what you would probably surmise then is that because uh, animal fats and if you look at uh, coconut oil and stuff like that, they're very, very thick or uh, beef fat is solid at room temperature. So if they're solid at room temperature, they are considered a fat. If they're liquid at room temperature, they're considered an oil. And you'll know that you'll notice that these are all oils. So what happens is that this unsaturation point lowers the melting point of your triglycerides. And so foods that have a high percentage of monounsaturates in their triglycerides would tend to have lower melting points and would tend to be oils. Okay. Um, then we have the polyunsaturates, and you'll notice the bo bottom two uh, diagrams are both labeled polyunsaturated fatty acid. The difference between them is if you look at the very end, you'll see this is the omega-3 and this is omega-6. The reason they're called polyunsaturate is because poly means many, and so Therefore, you'd assume that uh, there are many unsaturation points or many points where you're missing hydrogens, also creating double bonds uh, within these fatty acid chains. So in this case, you'll notice there's one, two, three places where we're missing hydrogens or creating double bonds. Uh, and uh, then there are here one, two places that are uh, missing hydrogen. So both of them are poly because they're greater than one. Um, and But um, one's called omega-3 and one's called omega-6. The difference between them is that if you start at this end, which is called the methyl end, and you count over one, two, three carbons, you'll notice that the first double bond is on that third carbon. Well, that's an omega-3. Here you'll notice one, two, three, four, five, six. The first double bond is an omega-6. Um, so um, these are essential fatty acids. Uh, linolenic is omega-3. Linoleic is omega-6 uh, fatty acids. Now their significance is that uh, you'll find uh, foods that are high in omega-3 or specifically linolenic acid in canola oil and soybean oils. Um, and then you've probably heard omega-3s when you've seen advertisements for fish oil. Well, fish oils also have uh, omega-3s in them, but they're not linolenic acid. 
they're called EPA or DHA. So this is what you'd be looking for if you were going out to purchase uh, fish oil pills. When you look on the back of the um, back label of those supplements, what you'd be looking for is the amount of EPA and DHA in those. Now the recommendation is that you have, uh, if you're going to take a supplement, you have about one gram or a thousand milligrams of the EPA DHA. Usually EPA is a little bit higher than the DHA, but you have to be careful. Again, reading your food label, look on the back because you will find some fish oil products that don't have a lot of EPA or DHA on them. So what you want to do is look at the label of those fish oils, look on the back, and make sure your EPA and DHA add up to about 1,000 milligrams or one gram. Um, if they don't, then I would look for another uh, product because the recommendation is if you take a supplement, you want to take about one gram per day. Um, so make sure you're buying good fish oils when you do that. But again, they're both omega-3 because you can see linolenic, you go 1, 2, 3 here, EPA 1, 2, 3, first double bond, DHA 1, 2, 3, first double bond. But you can notice uh, after that point, they become quite a bit different. Um, Basically, this up here indicates how many carbons. So there's 18 carbons here, 20 here, 20 here. Uh, and But they all are omega-3. Uh, but this indicates that we have three double bonds. So you see one, two, three. Here we have five. One, two, three, four, five. Here we have six. One, two, three, four five six so that's what this is kind of indicating is first of all how many carbons in the chain second of all how many double bonds and then when is the first double bond and that is the third so they're all omega-3s but they're uh, after that they're a little bit different in the number of double bonds they have and stuff like that um, but uh, linolenic acid can be converted into EPA and DHA by your body. So that's again why canola oil, you'll notice, have noticed that canola oil is high in monounsaturates and polyunsaturates. And the reason uh, that they that could be stated that way is if you compare them to other plant products or other plant oils, they are higher in both of those. So canola oil is considered a good oil. Um, and, uh, but olive oil also because of its high monounsaturates. Uh, but when you eat linolenic, it can be converted. Now, anytime your body does some conversions, there is some loss. So the, the percentage uh, that you eat of linolenic that's converted is, is going to be a lower percentage. But when you eat fish, you're actually eating these. Uh, and so there's no conversion necessary. It's a little bit more efficient. But um, we'll talk a little bit more about these in heart disease. But they're considered healthy and for reasons that we'll talk about later. Now, omega-6s, you'll find um, with the linoleic, you'll find in vegetable seed oil. So like corn oil and safflower oil, um, sunflower seed oil would be high in omega-6. And what we're going to see later is um, they're not considered as good as a canola oil or an olive oil, and we'll talk about why uh, later on in another session on heart disease. <clears throat> and I just have this just to show you that, you know, what, what type of fish would be highest in omega-3 fatty acids, and it's going to be the fish of color. It's going to be the darker fleshed fish. So as you see salmon and tuna and some of these anchovies, would be darker in color and then uh, they would have the highest amount of oils and so they have the highest omega-3s. You can see down here scallops which are basically white and cod which is basically white 
and those kinds of uh, fish are very not very high. They do have omega-3s in them, but nothing like the colored flesh fish. So if you're eating fish to get your omega-3s, you would want to get the darker colored fish in order to make sure you're getting adequate amounts. If you're eating scallops, you're not getting a lot. Still good, but not um, like some of the other ones that are darker colored. I wanted to go over a little bit about um, oxidation with you because you hear a lot nowadays about antioxidants. Uh, we talked a little bit about them uh, in uh, phytochemicals and things like that. Um, and so you hear a lot about uh, oxidation, you hear a lot about antioxidants. and. Uh, one of the bigger issues in nutrition circles is uh, reducing the amount of oxidation because that can lead to cancer, can lead to heart disease. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what is oxidation and uh, what are the characteristics of oxidation. First of all, a, a fatty acid that can be oxidized has to be unsaturated. So saturated fatty acids uh, uh, that do not have a double bond will not go through oxidation because you have to have that double bond which is kind of a weaker bond. It's, it's, it's an area where it's easier to have oxidation. Um, and we won't go into the reasons why but um, just take my word for it for this, in this case. Um, but you need to start with an unsaturated fatty acid and um, you're going to have a condition where that fatty acid will lose an electron and form what's called a free radical. In some advertisements and stuff you may have heard the term uh, free radical. And so Uh, we'll go over that just a, a little bit and make sure that you understand what that means. It's, it's a little bit more difficult if you haven't had any chemistry, but I'll try to do the best I can. But the idea is that um, when, when a fatty acid loses an electron, it becomes very, very reactive. And so if you do have that fatty acid exposed to oxygen, uh, it's going to go through oxidation and eventually it's going to form something called a hydroperoxide and um, that is when your your food is going to be oxidated it's going to be maybe considered rancid um, and it's going to it can cause off flavors and off colors and things like that so when you have an oily product that kind of turns color it's being oxidized and then if you taste a food that's been on the shelf for a long time it just tastes a little bit off a little bit musty or something it's been oxidized um, and so uh, I this on the right hand side this figure kind of goes through the process is you have a fatty acid compound and you'll notice that it has a double bond there so it's unsaturated and then if conditions are right you'll notice that this is a CH2 which means it has two hydrogens but here you notice that you've lost a hydrogen and this little dot means that you're basically have formed a free radical uh, which is means that you have a an electron that's unpaired and it's very very reactive okay so if we go down an, another step here what you'll notice is here's this free radical and then if you have exposure to oxygen you'll form a peroxide uh, you know hydrogen peroxide is H2O2 so we have these two oxygens so it makes it a peroxide but you haven't gotten rid of your free radical yet so this is still very very reactive and so you can read this information but if you go down here what can happen is this can actually steal an electron because it's so reactive it will steal a hydrogen from another fatty acid and become what's called a hydroperoxide so you can see this is OOH so we have the two oxygens peroxide and then adding the 
hydrogen gives you a hydroperoxide. They, it's just a term they call it. So this would then be a fatty acid that has been oxidized. Um, and what happens though is this this uh, fatty acid that you that it stole the hydrogen from then creates its own free radical and so basically you're back up here and you just make a, a circle you know going this way I guess um, and you'll just keep oxidizing more and more fats until it's stopped and so that's where antioxidants would come in so your antioxidants like your phytochemicals your carotenoids and stuff and your vitamin C and your vitamin E its job is to take care of this free radical uh, and so uh, antioxidants would prevent oxidation they would prevent the fatty acids from becoming hydroperoxides uh, and so that's why they're called antioxidants now what can initiate this uh, free radical formation high heat uh, other free radicals, oxygen, um, uh, all of these. So you might recognize where uh, this could be an issue. Uh, if you think about foods that are exposed to high heat, they're exposed to potential fatty acids that have free radicals, and they're very exposed to oxygen. And one thing that might come to mind is deep fried foods. So things like french fries and things like onion rings or anything that's deep fat fried has a risk of forming um, hydro hydroperoxides in the oil. Now the, the issue would be that, um, you know, fresh oil probably you know, wouldn't have as as many or if any um, oxidated fatty acids. Uh, so if you get your French fries from, you know, the first oil, you know, after they fill it with new oil, it may not be that may not be an issue. I mean, there are other issues with the heating French fries, but uh, the oxidation issue would not be there. But if you get your French fries, you know, the last batch before they change the oil the chances of you getting free radicals plus uh, oxidated fats, uh, fatty acids could be very high. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the drawbacks of, of, of eating uh, deep fried foods besides the fat stuff is the potential of eating uh, oxidated foods which can be a problem and we'll talk about those with heart disease but again antioxidants uh, they can donate electrons so they can donate electrons without becoming uh, forming free radicals themselves so therefore you take care of this this uh, free radical problem uh, and um, you wouldn't have then uh, you wouldn't have it going through and forming hydroperoxides Another term that you may have heard is hydrogenation, and hydrogenation is where you are going to take an unsaturated fatty acid, okay, and you're going to add a hydrogen, so therefore hydrogenation. You're going to add a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and basically make it saturated you're going to take for example something like Crisco uh, or some shortening what you'll notice on the label is it says all vegetable well what we've just discussed is that vegetable oils are basically high in omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids therefore if you take an oil and you add hydrogens to it. If you remember, the reason they're oils is because they're missing hydrogens and become unsaturated. So if we add hydrogens to them, basically forcing uh, hydrogens into uh, the fatty acid and making them attach to the carbons, then you are going to reduce your double bonds and become more and more saturated. Okay. 
But and and so uh, producers can make their fatty acids. Uh, as you get more, let me start over. As you get more and more saturated, obviously you're going to get more and more solid at room temperature. So shortening is very hard at room temperature. It's very very highly hydrogenated. Whereas margarine, which comes from plant oils, is not hard like shortening but it's it's not an oil it's kind of in between so it's very spreadable so you can you can determine how solid you want your material by how many hydrogens you put into those fatty acids um, and so what you'll read on labels is um, you'll you'll find partially hydrogenated Oil. So if you look on your ingredient label and you see partially hydrogenated, then you know that it has gone through hydrogenation. They have taken a polyunsaturate. They've added hydrogens to it to the point where they're happy with its texture, um, with how solid it is. The problem with it, when you go through hydrogenation, over on the right-hand side, what you'll see is what is considered uh, I, I should have mentioned that when you have partially hydrogenated you're going to be forming uh, quite a few monounsaturated fatty acids um, and normal monounsaturates are in what are what it's called the cis form and that is uh, where you basically have and these two little things are hydro you have hydrogens on the same side of these of where the double bond is so they're on the same side or on the right hand side here um, and so that's that would be the the normal natural formation of a monounsaturate so you know something you'd find in olive oil or something like that um, whereas trans fatty acids which come from uh, hydrogenation these are still monounsaturated but you notice the hydrogens on opposite sides so what that does you'll notice this one is kind of uh, got a curve to it whereas this one is very straight so um, saturated fatty acids are very very straight so when you make a monounsaturated that is has the transform to it, it becomes very, very similar as far as your body is concerned as a saturated fatty acid. Okay. And as we'll see, saturated fatty acids, you know, or have you've heard, you know, reduce your saturated uh, foods uh, because of heart disease and things like that. Well, um, that becomes the same problem with a trans fatty acid plus more and we'll talk more as we go through um, so what you'll see on food labels now is that they're putting trans fatty acids on there because in reality we don't know how many we are eating and these are not natural there are some natural trans fatty acids you'll find some in milk and stuff but not we don't eat those very you know we don't get a lot of them and we are eating a ton of trans fatty acids now we don't even know how much we're eating because um, if you've ever worked in a fast food plant what you'll uh, or fast food place a restaurant you what you'll notice is that the uh, deep fried oils that when you fill the deep fat fryer the oils are either solid or they're very very thick which means that you know they don't use beef fat in deep fat fryers they use plant fats and these are going to be fats uh, that have gone through hydrogenation because they have a longer shelf life if you remember we said that saturated fatty acids cannot go through oxidation so if you make a plant oil more saturated it is less likely to go through oxidation so basically it's less likely to spoil if you will or become rancid so you can keep it on the shelf for a long long time without it going bad 
Um, so, you know, from a business standpoint, it just makes sense uh, to use hydrogenated oils because um, you can keep them on a warehouse shelf for a long, long time, and they'll still be uh, they'll still be good, and they won't go you know they won't be as susceptible to oxidation. Uh, but um, these trans fatty acids, since they still have a double bond, are subject to os oxidation. So, one thing about deep fat fruit, fi deep fat fried foods, is not only have you the risk of getting oxidated fatty acids, you also have um, trans fatty acids that you're eating. And so it's kind of a double whammy. So uh, I guess my warning would be, uh, you know, is it okay to eat deep fat fried foods? Well, sure, every once in a while. But the problem is there's a lot of people who eat a ton of those, right? A deep fried everything. So you have to be careful because in reality, uh, we've only begun to figure out, you know, uh, by eating a, as many trans fatty acids as we're now eating that are unnatural, we're just beginning to find out what are the side effects or the, the bad side effects of these trans fatty acids. We know some of them and we uh, know the risks for cancer, heart disease and things like that, but there's probably more because they are not natural, okay? Uh, but every once in a while you can have french fries. It's just that if you eat them, you know, four or five, six times a week, uh, that's not good. You know, that's, that's not healthy because they're not natural, okay? And then I'm just showing you just a, a table of uh, how many, you know, what foods would be high in trans fat. So onion, you know, anything deep fat fried uh, is going to be high. And then you'll know that, you know, in things that they use a lot of shortening or a lot of margarine in, you know, kind of, you know, what do you, you know, the question might be, what do you eat, butter or margarine? Well, butter is high in saturated. Some people might argue, well, it's natural. And that's a, you know, okay argument. Uh, but it's still high in saturated fatty acids. And margarine is high in trans fatty acids because they take oils and hydrogenate them. So um, anytime, you know, you're, you know, what is the choice between butter and margarine? You know, either one, if you don't eat a lot, right? Um, I mean, I don't understand putting margarine on pancakes when you put syrup over the top. You can't taste the margarine. Uh, it makes no sense to me, but then everybody does it. Um, and then why would you put butter on toast and then put jelly over the butter? It makes no sense. Uh, but that's just me. So anyway, um, so just just so you know, you have to be careful, uh, especially with pre-prepared foods. You know, the first thing you want to do is look on the back of the label, look at the ingredient list, and if partially hydrogenated oils are at least, you know, they usually say the top three, but I would say the top five, one of the top five on the ingredient list you're going to be getting a lot of trans fatty acids. Um, so, and then the labeling laws basically say that uh, if you're under five grams of trans fatty acids, then um, you don't have to say it has them in there. So you could be at 4.9 and um, you could lay, you're on, as far as labeling laws are concerned, uh, you would, you could label and say no trans fatty acids. But again, if you look on the food ingredient label and you see partially hydrogenated in there, then it does have trans fatty. It may be less than five, but um, you uh, uh, still are getting those. And then depending on how many you eat, I mean, point uh, four point nine will add up. You know, if you eat a lot of it. So just be careful with that. And even though the, the product says zero trans fats, 
look at the ingredient label and then you'll know you're getting some if it's partially hydrogenated. The other two fatty acids besides the triglycerides are phospholipids and cholesterol and we'll talk more about these when we get into the um, lipoproteins but I just want you to know the main thing is that um, in phospholipids they have one end this kind of colored end that is water soluble so it's hydrophilic and then these two are fatty acids that um, are not water soluble as you know um, oils fats and stuff are not soluble in water and so um, <clears throat> these two fatty acids would not be soluble in water they'd be hydrophobic but they would be lipophilic, if you will, and this would be hydrophilic or it likes water. And so we'll see how that is important in uh, forming cell structure. Uh, or if you've taken biology, you know that the plasma membrane is made up of mostly phospholipids and because of this feature. Uh, but we're also going to talk about them in... in uh, looking at how are lipids transported around the body. Obviously if they're not soluble in the water you can't just throw a lipid into your bloodstream because it would float just like oil does. So there has to be some type of transporters and we're going to call those lipoproteins. And then cholesterol, I know you've heard a lot about cholesterol. Cholesterol basically is in the sterol form so this part of the cholesterol is a steroid and then we have a hydroxyl group that's water soluble um, and if you have taken biology you'll know that animal plasma membranes have cholesterol in them um, for stability uh, when we get into digestion we'll see that bile that's produced by the liver and is in the gallbladder is also is made up of um, cholesterol and then hormones, you know, fats, uh, hormones, steroids are going to be made from cholesterol, testosterone, estrogens, those kinds of things. So cholesterol we're going to see is important. You can't live without it, but we'll see as we get into heart disease and stuff that if it's in the wrong place, in the wrong form, it, it can form plaque. So these are the lipids. Uh, and I just kind of briefly introduced them. What I need you to remember out of this is, uh, you know, their main structures, but uh, also the idea of hydrogenation, oxidation, because those are going to become very important in discussion of heart disease and also the connection of saturated fats and mono and polyunsaturated fats in our diet and their um, relationship to heart disease. So we'll talk about those